Welcome to the biohackingmyillness.com podcast, biohacking your way to optimal health. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal doctor. And now, your host and biohacking coach, Dr. Arthur Mariano. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of BiohackingMyIllness.com. Today, I brought uh, Gregory Russell Jones, a PhD who's been working on B12 efficiency for the past decades, actually. Um, I got very interested in this topic because my homocysteine in, was very high and my methylation was not working properly. I found his work and I decided to give it a shot and uh, talking to him uh, was a really good conversation on um, B12 deficiency or functional deficiency if you wish, which pretty much boils down to um, not being able to utilize B12 in the body because it's not active. And there's um, underlying reasons for that, including B2 deficiency or functional deficiency as well. Uh, and this was such an incredible conversation. I apologize because my face, I, I pretty much got all of my nose in the video, but not much else. Uh, the camera was not working properly and I only realized that after the recording. Um, apologies for that. And I hope that you enjoy this, this episode, the first episode of, of this podcast. A lot more are going to follow, so, so make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Um, the next guests are going to be, um, they are related to gut health and detox, heavy metals. Uh, I've already have a lot of them lined up. And also remember that I don't make any money off of this project. So if you wish, uh, you can donate. Even if it is just a dollar, it will be, it will probably go a long way to support the project. And you can PayPal me at buyhackingmyillness at gmail.com. I hope you like this episode and uh, yeah, just uh, in good health. Uh, welcome to another episode of our podcast. Today, it's an honor to have Gregory Russell Jones with me. He has been working on various aspects of B12 deficiency for the past 35 years. Um, I'm 32, so this is quite relevant, uh, in, uh, including, <laughs> <laughs> including um, cloning of intrinsic factor using B12, um, using B12 as an oral delivery agent for peptides, proteins, and nanoparticles, as well as the use of B12 for cancer identification and targeting. More recently, he has been turned his attention to the role of B12 in conditions as diverse as chronic fatigue syndrome, autism spectrum disorder, depression, dementia, and Parkinson's disease. In the recent work, he has combined metabolic analysis of the conditions to identify contributing factors to the development of functional vitamin B12 deficiency, and we will talk about this quite extensively, I think, what's, what's functional B12 deficiency, um, and, and uh, has therapy um, been able to identify the cause of paradox, paradoxical um, vitamin B12 deficiency, which is a general feature of the uh, conditions that I was just talking about. Uh, using the approach, he has been able to achieve many successful outcomes in the treatment of these conditions, and we'll, we'll talk about this. Greg, thank you so much again for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so let's jump into the questions. We uh, have uh, quite a few things to talk about, So, and it's quite late there. We are probably in the farthest time zones possible, um, and it was, it was quite hard to, uh, to schedule this. Um, so for people, we have two kinds of people watching this podcast. Some of them have chronic diseases that they would like to solve and they've been, you know, through all kinds of doctors and practitioners and they are still trying to work on the diseases themselves. And then we have people who are perfectly healthy, but they want to increase their longevity and, and, uh, and whatnot and just optimize their health in general. Uh, I think that today I would like to talk more to people who have chronic diseases and would like to work on that uh, on their methylation. And some of those people have done extensive work, like myself, um, on methylation without achieving very good results. So I think that the the um, the things that we are going to talk about today are probably very 
meaningful for, for these people. So the first question that I have is, what is methylation for people that don't know anything about it? And what systems does it affect in the human body? So methylation is a general term for putting a methyl group on things. But when they talk about methyl, a methyl group is a CH3 group that's it's on the end of all the amino, most amino acids, most lipids, whatever. But Methylation specifically regarded to B12 is to activate or inactivate something by putting the methyl group on and you use a particular uh, group that the enzymes use called s methionine and that s methionine methylates the protein, the DNA, the, um, the base, uh, the neurotransmitter, all of these other things, or um, it creates creatine, uh, methylation is involved in making CoQ10. There's about 200 methylation reactions in the body. And basically, it, once you start to reduce your methylation by not having sufficient methylation cycling, then these reactions start to slow down. And so when they slow down enough, you can get chronic fatigue syndrome. And if they slow down enough in children, you get autism. So it's basically a slowing down and it's a gradual scale. It doesn't stop, obviously. If it stopped, you'd be dead pretty much. But yeah, so what you're looking at when you do the analysis is to see how much these factors have been reduced. Right. Yeah, um, a lot of people try to figure out whether their methylation is working properly or not. And uh, by properly, just like you said, it just slows down. It's impossible that it gets turned off. Otherwise, we would die, right? What are the, uh, the easiest ways to know if we are methylating properly? People look into homocysteine on blood. Is this a good indicator or, or would you say that there's more? In better ones. So homocysteine is, is an end product in the methylation cycle, basically, and you need B12 to convert homocysteine back to methionine. So methyl B12 methylates homocysteine and you get methionine. So this can be a good marker and some people get extremely elevated levels of homocysteine and then it's obvious that there's a problem with the B12 cycle. But in functional B2 um, deficiency, your, your methionine can be um, taken into the energy cycle and degraded for calories, basically. And so the amount of homocysteine you get can be um, lower than one might expect. So in that respect, it's not one of the best markers. It's a common marker. Uh, homocysteine and it's a standard marker. However, however, I use the oat organic acids test to look for other products that I can see in there, which are signs that the methylation's gone down. The other thing that people often use is the SAM to SAH ratio, the s methionine to s homocysteine ratio to see whether that's been reduced. So if you're not making more SAM, you get stuck in s um, homocysteine and then you get homocysteine after that. So you can use that ratio. Most people who think they really have problems um, do lots and lots of tests and you get lots and lots of data and, and people look at it and say, well, it's wrong, but why is it wrong and what does it mean? And unfortunately, I think that for most of the practitioners who use the, these analyses, they don't really understand what it is. So I can look at some data and I can say, why wasn't this picked up? You know, it's obvious what's wrong. Why isn't it picked up? Right. And I, I'm assuming that a lot of people send you a lot of tests. You know, we will talk about the B12 oils um, at the end of the uh, at the end of the podcast. But I'm assuming that a lot of people send you a lot of tests, um, and you've seen all this, all these tests being evident um, as far as having something wrong, and they didn't have pick up any problem before, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the problem is, so if you're, if you are not, uh, if you don't have functional vitamin B2, then B12 doesn't cycle properly, but you get a buildup of inactive B12 in serum, which is what I call paradoxical B12 deficiency. So you have this buildup of B12 in serum, 
but functionally you're deficient in B12. And so this is a paradox. How can I have B12 there, but it's not working? Well, it's the wrong form. It's an inactive form that's in serum. And so you get lots of data with very high levels of B12 in serum. And this confuses the Medicaid because it's, well, it can't be B12 deficiency. You've got plenty of B12 there. How can you be deficient? And that's why you have to go to these metabolic markers to establish the deficiency. The other way you just establish it in adults who can talk, explain what's going on, is by the symptoms, but clearly in children who are autistic, for instance, they can't explain anything. So you can't tell from them how they're feeling, whether they've got depression, whether they've got fatigue or what they have. But you, so you go on the symptoms and you say, okay, well, you've got elevated B12, but you have a massive number of symptoms of B12 deficiency. Right. And probably one of those cases, um, not long ago, I had very, very high B12 um, serum levels and my homocysteine was still like super, super high. I think that my homocysteine was at 15 and my B12 was probably the double of the upper range. Um, it could be due to anything else other than, than methylation. I know now that it's methylation not working properly, but, but I was one of those, I was one of those people and I was using B12 without looking at the functional deficiency. And I was just assuming that, you know, popping some B12 inside would, would fix the problem. And, and um, we'll talk about that. It's not, it's not the case. Anyways, would, would there be any other marker that is so evident? For instance, people talk about low, very low or very high cobalt in hair tests. Would this, would this be an indicator that methylation is not working properly as well? So if you had very low cobalt, then you might assume that you actually your dietary intake was very low. If you have very high cobalt, you're probably supplementing with a lot and it's going into hair, but it doesn't mean that it's active. It just means that it's there. So the hair metals test analysis is um, okay. It's pretty good for iron to tell you how much you've got. Um, and it's very good for iodine, selenium, and molybdenum. It tells you where it's going. And when you read it properly, you can tell whether a person is on a diet that's got leafy green veggies or not, or a diet where they're having sufficient calcium, um, which they are or are not um, processing through vitamin D. So there's a lot of markers in there. I found it's pretty useless as far as what people think it's useful for, which is to see whether you're dying of some sort of heavy metal toxicity. But, um, and this is, this is also mistaken. People will see a mercury level in there and say, oh, I'm dying from mercury poisoning. But when you compare it to just having a meal which has got known mercury in it, um, such as fish or prawns or something like that, really, I, I've never seen anything that was that was really high in any of these for mercury. If you live in Singapore, there's mercury in the air everywhere because they're burning fossil fuels. And people in Singapore have very high levels of mercury, but they don't all have chronic fatigue and they don't all have autism, obviously. So it's not been a particularly useful thing for heavy metal contamination. Thallium might be an exception, but it's been very, very useful for iodine, selenium, and molybdenum and iron, I think. What about calcium? Well, it's, it's good for calcium too because calcium also is involved as a signaling molecule in the brain. And if your calcium levels are too low, then you're not going to interrupt signaling. You see low calcium in a lot of people who go on exclusive diets where they try to avoid dairy because they believe that they're reacting to the, the dairy. And that's, yeah, yep. right. So your hair calcium would probably be low, say, sort of, say, 300, um, whereas mine would be 1,200. So... Yeah, so I can tell, you can tell whether someone's on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet from the hair metal. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Guilty as charged, by the way. Um, okay, so, and by the way, you look at those minerals um, as face value, right? To iron, calcium, molybdenum, and, and all those, they are pretty much face value, right? If they are low on hair test, on, on a hair test, it means that the person is deficient, generally. That's the way I read it. So it's parts per million. You have to be careful of whose test it is because sometimes it's milligrams per cent, which is a different number, and you have to multiply. But, yes, looking at that, um, if I had enough data, I could probably pick the state that you live in 
by the heavy metals that are in your hair in the US, for instance, because they oh. you can pick up uranium for some people who live in North Carolina, for instance. And so, right. yeah, you can pick some of those things up from that. Um, and you tend to find that in different states in the US, I'm not sure about in Portugal, but in different states in the US, there'll be different degrees of selenium or molybdenum deficiency. Right. So you can pick that. You, when you start to get enough data, you can put them together and group them and then look and say, yeah, this is fairly typical of the area that you live in. So it's been kind of interesting to see that. You get your first one and you've got no idea what, what the rest of them are like. But, you know, once you start to get to 100 or 1,000, you're starting to get some clues about what's going on. In my own case, it would be difficult because I've, I've pretty much lived everywhere in the world. And, and I'm pretty much picking the deficiencies of all the places and, and perhaps the, the toxicities of all those places. But, but it's, it's very interesting. Never thought about it. Okay, so coming back to methylation, how does methylation affect the thyroid or how, how does the thyroid affect methylation? Okay, so it's the thyroid that's affecting methylation. So the thyroid cascade, and which is why I keep going back to iodine, selenium, and molybdenum, Thyroid cascade uses iodine, selenium, and molybdenum as part of the process of activating vitamin B2, so riboflavin. So if, 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 if the cascade doesn't work, you don't activate riboflavin, you can have literally grams per day if you can want to have that color urine all day, um, but it's not active and so it will not help you. So you need this thyroid cascade to activate vitamin B2, and B2 is essential for B12 cycling. It's essential for bringing um, folate out of the, for bringing the methyl group out of the folate cycle into the methylation cycle, and it's essential for, for preserving the activity of methionine synthase reductase, which is a rescue enzyme in the methylation pathway. So, People who become functionally deficient in B2 become eventually functionally deficient in B12. And around 50% of women with hyperthyroidism eventually become B12 deficient because of it. So in hyperthyroidism, you're not activating the thyroid cascade. And so you're getting lower and lower levels of B2. And um, one of the associated things is you cannot burn fat and paradoxical weight gain is one of the first signs of hyperthyroidism. So you can see how they sort of link in when you look at it. Hi, enjoying this podcast? Know that a lot more are going to follow. So please make sure to subscribe to the channel. And also, if you have suggestions on guests to invite to this podcast, leave them down below. Also, I would like to know if you uh, have any particular question regarding this podcast. And if you have any particular comment or remark um, on this discussion, please do let me know in the comments down below and uh, let's get back to it. We're talking about uh, using, for instance, B12 uh, while having a functional B12 deficiency before. And, um, and I, I forgot to ask you whether high levels of B12, inactive B12 that is, could be toxic to the human body. They're not so much toxic, but they compete with active B12. So you imagine if you've got 10,000 times as much inactive B12 and you've only got a protein. So you've got a pro your transport protein can only bind 1,000 molecules and you've got 10,000 molecules of inactive B12 and you've only got one molecule of active. And on a competitive basis, you're not getting very much active in. So right. in that respect, you start to get more and more signs of B12 deficiency, which then in the end, it's pretty serious actually B12 deficiency. You can die from B12 deficiency. I know of a person who would not take selenium and they eventually um, were put on an oxygen respirator and they died basically because they wouldn't start initiate that cascade. Right. So it's pretty, it's pretty serious. And the people with chronic fatigue, some of the stories that you hear of these bed, bed bound people who can only function for 15 minutes a day, they're pretty horrendous. So it's not something you want to contemplate having. <laughs> right, exactly. So let's talk about common mistakes in methylation. Um, we, talk, we talked about some of them, for instance, B2, B2 deficiency and, and, uh, and the, the missing cofactors like iodine, selenium. So um, I would say, based on what he said, that one of the most relevant uh, mistakes in, in improving methylation is the fact that people disregard B2 
um, because they don't understand the connection, but also they take the wrong forms of selenium and perhaps iodine. Would you, would you second this? Definitely the wrong forms of selenium. So the thing that can be confusing here is you can take a lot of oral selenium and your hair metal analysis goes up, obviously, because you've taken it, but it's inactive. So you, the most common ones that are used are selenomethionine, and that goes into the methionine pool. And so you, it's incorporated into nearly every protein into the body because nearly most of them, about 99% of the proteins have got methionine in them, and that's incorporated. So it looks like you're getting um, selenium in it, but it's not. It's selenomethionine. And you can process selenomethionine and make and get the sel selenium group off it, but not when you're B12 deficient. Uh, and so in, in terms of selenium, the, the right form would be selenite, right? In, in my experience, that seems to be the one that's working routinely the best. Um, there is selenate as well. But what I do is I tend to go and look at the people who, who are really making money out of getting supplementation right. The people who are making money out of supplementation are the people in animal production. And there, if they feed the wrong thing, they don't get what they want to. They feed the right thing, they get better production. They use selenite. So to me, you know, the, your average farmer, he's pretty cost conscious. He's not going to use something unless it works. And they use selenite. In the supplementation in Finland, they use selenite. Um, and we have a selenite oil that we've done, that we've produced because there's so many supplements out there that have got problems with them. They can have selenite in them, but if they've got copper or calcium or magnesium, binds up the selenite, that's not a available or it has some reducing agent in it and so the selenite is converted to something else. So yeah, you have to be careful about what you're doing with selenium. Um, it has to be the right form. You have to take it the right way and you can't take it with other things that interfere with absorption or which chelate it or reduce it. Right. I would say that, that we, we should pay extra attention to selenium, not only because the taking the right form, the, the wrong form would not uh, help methylation is also taking the, the wrong form would probably be toxic, right? Selenium methionide would be, would be toxic in the body, right? Yeah, so, so they've used selenium at very high doses for cancer therapy. And you can understand that if you use selenium methionine and then it goes into the proteins and it's incorporated where methionine is, that you could disrupt the activity of that protein. And so then that might have an anti-cancer effect. So they find in much higher doses than you're supposed to use. Um, so you recommend daily allowance is somewhere between 55 and 200 micrograms per day. But if you were using five or 10 milligrams or higher than that, then you can have an effect. So the, it is toxic at high doses, but people have to, I get this comment quite often, oh, isn't selenium toxic? And you look at the study that they're looking at and they're, they might be looking at milligrams in a mouse, for instance. Well, if you convert the weight of milligrams in a mouse to the weight of a human, it's grams in a human. So you've got to be very careful about those studies, about what they mean and what the relative doses are. Right. And, and let's say that people were taking, because they didn't know any better, they were taking selenium methionine and... Um, and they just built very high levels of this of this form of selenium in their body. As long as soon as they get their methylation to work better, that will be cleared up. Am I right? Only in as much as you have a half life for most proteins, they, they don't last forever. They will they most proteins are eventually degraded. At that point, you secrete them. And so the, the, the selenomethionine will go at that, that stage. Um, whether you can, there's only there's around 22 proteins that have selenium in the right place on them, the selenoproteins. Um, and the other thing, the other reason that you want to have the right form is because is it's transported into the brain. So there's a transporter to get selenium in the brain. And I think people don't understand that. Uh, so wherever you need vitamin B2, you need selenium, basically. And so there's a big demand for it in the eye, for instance. So there are enzymes in the eye that are processing B2. 
And uh, yeah, so that's another reason we get the right thing. But of course, it's in the brain. And the brain hangs on to selenium uh, very strongly. So you can drop off in your other tissues, but the brain is hanging on to it. So it's very important to get it right. And if you don't get it right, and you don't get it into the brain, you don't have a transport system that gets into the brain, you can have some of your peripheral signs can go. You might have more energy, but the, the bit that you want to fix is in the brain. What about B2 um, functional deficiency? How is there any specific form of uh, riboflavin that we should be taking or would any work for that particular matter? Okay, so there's a, there's a theory around that you need activated B2, so the R5P that people use. The problem with this theory is that, that the riboflavin is phosphorylated once it's inside the cell. So the xylophosphate group is put on it so it can't leave the cell, so it doesn't diffuse out. So it's an after event that's put on. So you make FMN that way. You do the same with insulin, the day, you do the same with pyridoxal, you do the same, you know, I'm sorry, not with insulin, sorry, with glucose. So you have this way of trapping things inside the cell so they don't diffuse out. Um, so R5P, right, so the idea is that, that it's active, and so if you take it, it's just going to be active, but you block it getting into the cell. The other thing is that, the gut is very, very good at taking phosphate groups off things. So you have alkaline and acid phosphatases there that quite happily take the phosphate group off the activated um, B2 or the so-called activated, and you just get riboflavin taken up, and there's no difference. Though the other thing is it's got a disadvantage and because the phosphate group will chelate with calcium. So if you take it with the calcium thing, you make calcium phosphate, which is what your teeth are made of. It's pretty insoluble. And so you then go and get uptake. So it's another reason not to take these activated things or particularly to be careful not to take them with calcium. So my recommendations are always to take the straight riboflavin. The only advantage that R5P has is it's much more soluble than the straight riboflavin, but in the gut, it seems to solubilize it. You can get bright green urine very happily from taking straight riboflavin. Right, okay, that answers the question. So basically the straight up B2 is probably enough um, to solve this, this functional deficiency and, and the coenzymated, there's also the coenzymated, the activated forms, all those would have problems, especially if taken with calcium. That's that's take home message, right? Yeah, so they're all a con. They're all a con to make you pay more for right. something that you don't need, right? And so there, the, the special things, it's the same with the uh, the five methyl tetrahydrofolate. It again is a con, right? To take it. So and there's issues with that as well. So but you would still say that not taking or not looking at B2 levels would be a common uh, mistake for people addressing methylation. They just disregard B2 uh, entirely. And as a result, they are not going to activate, say, B12 or, or the other cofactors in running into a problem, right? Correct. So um, most people also use the lozenge forms like, like I've done for, for a long time and use TMG um, as well. And uh, I've noticed quite a lot of a reduction in homocysteine levels, but I presume that my methylation is still not working properly. Why does this widely used, um, I mean, it's fat, I, I just presume it is very widely used because uh, I just go in, in, into Facebook forums or groups and they are talking about this lozenge plus DMG all the time. Why this, this doesn't work? We talked about, we talked about this before and, and the missing cofactors, but could you go into a little bit more detail why this strategy doesn't work? So when you've got functional B2 deficiency, whatever you put in, if you don't fix it, eventually becomes inactivated. So you can suck lozenges all day. And if you get them in slowly enough, you're just quietly inactivating them all the time come in. I have a lot of people who've come to me and they, they, they're having dentine repair on their teeth. They suck lozenges for so long and they come to me, they've still got chronic fatigue and they've still got functional B12 deficiency. There is another slightly more sinister um, thing about it, but we're trying to prove that. So I don't want to talk too much about that as well. 
Okay. But, um, yeah. Would you would you still say that TMG is a good um, auxiliary um, aid in terms of methylation, or is it just not necessary if we take all the right cofactors and and the right B12 forms and 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 B2 and all that? So it's mainly used in the liver, so it's not used in the brain. So you want your stuff to work in the brain, and it's it's like a bomb going off. Bomb goes off and you have bits everywhere. And then you decide that what you're going to do is take each of the bits and start to put them back together. And eventually you'll reassemble your bomb. But it, but if the reason you've got all these bits everywhere is because your B12 wasn't cycling because B2 wasn't cycling, then why not just fix it at, at there rather than take, you know, you can take carnitine, you can take creatine, you can take... DMG, you can take all these other things and I can give you an old list of all the others that Sam you can take, you can take all of these other things. But if you fix the deficiency, you're only taking a couple of things rather than putting the bomb back together, you know, taking all the bits that are not working and putting them in. And, and I think this is part of the problem in the field is that when you go and have a look, you find so many things that are wrong. So nearly everybody will find something. Oh, this is typical. We found this in all the people with chronic fatigue. They all have this. This must be the reason why they have a chronic fatigue. Or we found this in autism. We've, they're all like this. And, and it's because you're looking at the bomb. You're looking at the exploded bomb. You look at all the bits that are not working. And they're, they're going to be there. There's 100 enzymes or so that require B2. There's 200 methylation reactions in the body. There's about 100 um, reactions that require B6. B6 requires B2 to be activated. So if you don't fix B2, you've got 100 B2 reactions that aren't working, 100 B6 reactions that aren't working. There's 200 methylation reactions that aren't working. You can't activate um, vitamin D properly. You can't activate K. You can't activate A. So you can see that you know, you're trying to now fix this, this bomb that's exploded rather than saying, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fix the bit in the middle and that will fix all of these other reactions. And by the way, I don't have a bank that I can support a supplement cell for. So at most, TMG would be a Band-Aid, right? And not, not really fixing the, the root cause or the actual problem. Yes, would be a Band-Aid. So the, there's a couple of exceptions that might work in severe deficiency. So there are it, it, a lot of studies that are done on supplementation are done on people who are not really deficient. And when you get equivocal results because they didn't really need it anyway, so, but and people are super, super deficient. One of the things that I've found is that creatine might work. But if you eat red meat, you get creatine anyway. It's the same as lipoic acid. If you eat red meat, you get lipoic acid anyway. But lipoic acid is essential in the body. But if you're not eating stuff, you know, it's, you, you, you're reconstructing the, the, the exploded bomb again. Just eat the right food. You won't need to take the bits that were in the food. You don't need zinc. You don't need to take the copper. You don't need to take the iron. You don't need to take, like if you give up leafy green veggies because somebody said you've got high oxalates, then you've got to take folate. You've got to take the sodium. You've got to take potassium. You've got to take magnesium. You've got to take all of these other things, but you gave up the food substance that had them all in. Right, right. And it, on that note, with liver, because I, I eat a lot of liver and I, I tried, I was raised, you know, eating the steak, the, you know, the steak other than the organ meats. And I realized, you know, in this journey that organ meats are, are much higher when it comes to, to vitamin levels and, and mineral levels. Would you say that eating organ meats would be a, a good decision on, on that note? It's up to you as whether you like them. I, I went to school with steak and kidney pies. I hate it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I was just... well, terrible. I don't, don't, don't advise anyone eating anything that I wouldn't eat. <laughs> that, that's right. But I've, I've learned to look at food as, you know, rather than what I like, I prefer to eat foods that my body likes. Um, you know, that's, that's my approach to it. And I didn't like lever at first, to be honest, but as time went on yes. and I, and I basically learned on how to cook it to, to be, you know, pleasant. I, I just eat a lot of lever now on the, but, but for kidneys, that would be, that would be probably different. I, I hate them. But if I knew that they were helping my body quite extensively, I would probably eat them. Um, so we are approaching the end here. I would like to talk about the transdermal B12 oils. 
um, which is a project that you run and how they work and how they are superior to the other things that we were talking about, including the, the, the lozenges and the TMG and all, and all that? So the oils were the result of some experimentation that we did um, in some animals before when we were looking at trying to deliver macro molecules through the skin. So I developed this technology to do that and I can get very big, I can get um, IgG, I can get very large molecules, insulin, IGF-1, I can get all of these things through the skin. Um, and we started using B12 as an anti-inflammatory molecule. So the initial studies that we're using was with what is now called the B12 ice. So it was basically an anti-inflammatory and B12 has anti-inflammatory properties. And in our studies, it worked as an anti-inflammatory. And I used the B12 ice myself because I've got an osteo knee that acts up if I don't. So what I didn't realize when we got it together was just how many people in the world are B12 deficient and having trouble with high dose. So the thing is that the oral uptake system is very, very low. It's less than 1% of the dose that you give gets in. Um, it's normally about 0.1% and it's saturable. So at very low doses, you get a lot more than that. You get 50% in or 60% in. But as you increase the dose, the amount you get in is very low. So that's why they've gone to the lozenges so you can kind of get a trickle in and a trickle in and a trickle in and a trickle in. But with the oils, we, we think we can get about 80% in through the skin with it, judging from uh, animal studies that were done before. But also, if you see some of the reactions that people get to just a pinhead of oil, it's almost unbelievable as how, how strong the stuff is. Um, and so we see it as a uh, replacement for injectables. Uh, whether you have to take it more often, um, it's hard to say. Some people are saying are quite happy to take the oils every day and they come off injections to go on to the oil. So these people are happier to take it than injection. For autism, the kids hate injections. They get used to and they just scream and they know it's going to happen and the parents are sneaking up on these kids at night and then trying microneedles to get it into their heel and all of the rest of it. Um, so it's a very calming thing. You, I did um, a more or less a challenge experiment with somebody who had chronic fatigue and we were working out how much we could tolerate. <laughs> so we were doing about 16 doses a day on this for, you know, for several weeks and it was, was fine. So uh, you theoretically you excrete excess B12. So if you inject very high doses of B12, you get very red urine. So you do pee it out. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you excrete excess. Um, it's the two active, the ones we use are the two active ones forms. That's the methyl and the adenosyl. We used to sell the hydroxyl, but it's a, it's a pro vitamin. And people were basically use, they, they didn't buy it. So we stopped, stopped selling it. So, um, it, so that's basically, it, it's a high dose. You can do it repeatedly. It seems to work very well. Uh, a lot of people have been on lozenges and the lozenges haven't worked or ultra high dose um, methyl B12 orally and they find it doesn't work and then we get them on the protocol and then it's working nicely for them. It's nice and convenient. You don't have to refrigerate. It's not like the injections. You have to refrigerate them. It comes in this light protected container so you don't have to do that. Um, I've traveled all over the world with the stuff, so it's quite uh, resistant to extremes of heat and, and, um, and temperature, well, it's heat, uh, and you can freeze it and it still comes out, which in Australia is not a problem, but it's a problem in the US because people can have these things delivered at minus 20 or something like that, and so you have to know that this stuff will freeze and it's still okay. Uh, it wasn't thought of initially until somebody said, oh, is it okay if it's frozen? And I was like, oh, better do an experiment. So, yes, it's okay as far as it. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, uh, we worked, one of the reasons we, we looked at oral and transdermal insulin was because the cold chain for insulin is a pain in the neck. You have to keep stuff cold all the time. Um, so if people are travelling, this is a problem for the injectable B12 and stuff like that with the, with the um, transdermal oils. You can just take your little canister and away you go. Fine.
Right. Would it be an advantage to think that, well, first I see the, the uh, compared to oral supplements, I see the uh, liver bypass property of the transdermal oils, right? But also would the body, as opposed to injections, absorb only what it really needs? I mean, you, you said that taking it in, in excess is not a problem because you're going to beat out. But um, would the transdermal also offer that property, like the body absorbing only what it needs, or is it also 100% absorbed as well? Uh, you, you have to define what absorbed means. So it, it goes into the skin, it'll all go into the skin. So in that way, it's absorbed. It has a very flat profile of release because your skin's a very large organ. So when you put something into the skin, it goes into the largest organ in the body and it comes out of that organ very slowly over time. So we think the time kinetics is very similar to any of the, the transdermal patches that you might have for testosterone. Okay. And they, the peak in serum is four to six hours after you give it. So we say it as a very flat, even profile. What you're trying to do is get the B12 onto the transport protein. You're trying to deliver, uh, like um, you just keep loading this up over time, you load up some more, it's used, comes again, you load up. And that way you can maximize, you seem to be able to maximize delivery into the brain. We haven't shown that biochemically. I mean, but from what people tell us from their symptoms and what they're getting rid of, you know, brain fog and all the rest of it, then it does. We know from oral experiments that we did a long time ago that the amount of B12 that you get into the brain from oral, is less than 0.01% of the dose that you administer. So it's tiny. It is very, very small. And there's not been one study that I've seen where they've been able to fix dementia or those things with an oral B12 solution of any tool, any form. And it's just because it's so little gets there. Whereas you're maximizing, your dose is higher for the transdermal. You're maximizing this long, slow, prolonged uptake mechanism. And so thereby you're, you're, you're trying to optimize delivery into the brain. Right. What are the main symptoms that people are reporting the oils to help with? I mean, we've got a, a symptom form, which is about, I think it's 32 that we have. Um, we don't have all of the symptoms of B12 efficiency, but the biggest one for B12 is fatigue. By far, fatigue is the biggest. I mean, chronic fatigue, obviously, it's fatigue. Right? With autism, you don't know they're fatigued because they don't tell you. But for chronic fatigue, exactly. fatigue is the biggest thing. Depression is the next one. Anxiety. Um, then you have a whole lot of peripheral neuropathy things. So we had a, a woman who had lost a sensation in her feet, so she couldn't feel whether it's hot or cold on her feet, on the, you know, on the floor. She couldn't feel the touch of clothing on her skin, so she'd lost that sensation, all right? Um, and she was unstable in a gait. Obviously, if you can't feel the floor, you don't know what your foot's doing, so it's very hard to tell what's going on. She couldn't walk without a, a cane, and she ended up in one of those, you know, those four walker things that they have. Um, and she basically couldn't stand on anything without falling off, so she was always falling over. And um, she, so you're trying to fix the peripheral neuropathy. This doesn't happen overnight. You have to regrow myelin and you have to replace defective myelin. And you have to do it. It takes a long time to myelinate. But within two years on the protocol, she was walking without a cane. The first thing she got was a sensation back in her feet that she could feel. Um, then she got the sensation of touch on the skin. Um, and then she was walking unassisted up, up and down steps. And ostensibly, she didn't have any symptoms on our list of um, symptoms. So wow. fatigue, the anxiety went, all right. I mean, some of those stories with chronic fatigue are just amazing. I mean, right. you, you, you see it before and after to believe it, but you have to get it right. So if you don't get the whole process right, you get somewhere along the line, but you have to get it right. So if, you, if you're even marginally B2 sufficient, or deficient, sorry, can't fix the B12 deficiency properly. Right. What about brain fog? Is that, is that a symptom that people also report to improvement? That's one of the, that's the first one in the brain. So you get brain fog, fuzzy thinking, um, poor, word, poor sentence construction, failure to remember words, um concentration probably as well yeah concentration um insomnia sleeping difficulties 
Um, yeah, they're very common. They're very common. They are, I think it's probably 40 to 50% of people have those um, and in a symptom list. And it's often the first one that they get before they get the peripheral symptoms, before you get the prolonged demyelination. They'll get this early on. You can get the fatigue before you get the demyelination, but the brain fog and everything, that's very common for people. And that goes away. So they start to think. I mean, uh, and I mean, I won't go into too much um, detail with some of the people who've talked to me about it, but there's some, there's some pretty impressive things that go on. Um, right. Could you talk about people getting out of thyroid meds? Is that yeah, so this is, this is a bit of a trap. So a lot of people who are diagnosed with... Um, hypothyroidism, they're not checked for iodine or selenium deficiency. They're just put on meds. I have my own reasons for why I believe that is. But so when you start to fix the iodine deficiency, they have to titrate their meds because clearly they can go from being hypothyroidic to hyperthyroidic. And some of the symptoms are very similar. So you have to be careful about that. But yes, yeah, so one of the ways that you do this is you need to monitor your thyroid function um, and see where you sit with it. But you, uh, the, in paradoxical B12 deficiency, your thyroid, your TSH, if it's about above about 1.8, you can still be functionally deficient in B2, but you would not be judged as being hypothyroid at 1.8. So the standard now is about 4.5, but there are a lot of papers saying it should be reduced down to two. And in my hands, it should be um, reduced down to at least 1.8. So possibly lower. Right. Okay. I've got two last questions on people who want to try out the oils. Um, the first one is, should they be taking a B2 supplement before starting at least the B12 oil? Or should they start with the oils right away? Depends whether they're B2 deficient. If they have just pernicious anemia, for instance, they don't need to take B2 because they're all, that's their only deficiency is their inability to absorb B12. They can go straight on. And um, this woman who had the peripheral neuropathy, that's all that was wrong with it. She was just B12 deficient because she had pernicious anemia and she came back from it. But if you're, if you're B2 deficient, you need to fix that first before you... I mean, you can start with the oils. They will make some difference, but um, they're not... We know we're near as effective as fixing the B2 deficiency first. But, but what would be the the, um, the practical way to determine whether we are B2 deficient? Because in, in the way that I look at it, um, B2 also gets feed out, right? It gets excreted if we take too much. So just in, in straight riboflavin is really, really cheap. So would it be clever to just take B2 as a precaution um, because it's cheap anyways, it's going to be excreted by the body if we take too much um, rather than going to testing. So if you take B2 and it makes no difference, then it's because you haven't activated it. So there is a test in Europe that's, um, that's quite a nice test. It's called the EGRA test, um, erythrocyte glutathione reductase assay, an EGRA. And that is uh, quite predictive of deficiency. So you can see whether you're activating the B2 or not. A lot of the world is B2 deficient. I mean, there's a lot of people who have gone away from milk, for instance. I mean, dairy consumption is dropping around the world. And this must be to the great frustration of the people who have been supplementing the milk because they've been getting iodine into cows. So you get iodized milk. They have the cows have selenium in there to increase the production. So by getting rid of milk, you're getting rid of iodine, selenium, B2, calcium, you know, and a whole lot of other growth factors. So the idea that going to these alternative homogenized nut product, products is sort of, it's a rubbish concept. So um, you, then you could tell, you do the hair metal test analysis to see whether you're likely to be efficient in the cofactors or do the organic acid test, which is what I look at to see whether you're functionally deficient in B2. So that generally picks it up. Um, it's a question of time and money. Great. Right. In the best of all worlds, if all the assays were free, you'd get them all done, right? And if you had a health service that said, right, well, we'll do the assays. It's false economy not to do them, though, because you can then you can monitor where you are. You've got an explanation for why you're deficient, and then you can monitor yourself as you get better. I think for some people, so people with chronic fatigue, they don't understand why they have the fatigue. But if you can see it, you can see, oh, it's because I've got this deficiency. I think it helps them because a lot of people with chronic fatigue, nobody believes them. They don't believe they can have it, right? They don't believe they have the brain fog because these people look okay outside, 
except for the ones that are totally bedridden and they can't get up. And so it's a uh, it's proof of the pudding. It really it really is a proof to see why you've got it, and you can monitor it and you can look to see whether there are other deficiencies as well. You know. Right. right. Okay. Got it. So if people want to know, if people want to try out the oils, they should be, they should go to b12oils.com, right? They have the, they have the whole explanation of what we've, we've talked about and the cofactors and whatnot. And if they have questions, they could also join a Facebook group that you have, right? Uh, there is a Facebook group on understanding B12 deficiency. It's not a Facebook group that I have, but it's run by some very, very dedicated, lovely people on there who've got together because these people were not being treated sufficiently and because they've got benefit from it. And so they discuss problems, they discuss, you know, their, their symptoms and when they start up and all the rest of it, and they share ideas. They seem to be very supportive of each other and they have lots of data in there. I don't do Facebook. I don't have time to do Facebook. And I don't have time to argue with people on Facebook. So I've decided uh, I'm going to stay away from it. Alrighty. But they, if people have questions on the oils or, you know, questions as they use them, they should probably, I mean, that Facebook, that Facebook group is all, is, is probably a good uh, resource to use, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you've got people there who can share the experience and they've got a lot of data on there and uh i don't know how many it's on uh, about two thousand people at the moment i think so okay so i'll i'll leave the links to the b12 um balls.com website and also the facebook group um for people who want to try it out well hopefully it helps some people uh i'm, I'm sure it will okay so um thank you very much for listening to this podcast or viewing it on youtube and until the next one, read the disclaimer. All the the, uh, the links I mentioned are below. Um, thank you so very much, and um, see you on on the next episode. Bye. Right. So I hope that you guys enjoy this episode on B12 functional deficiency. You're welcome to um, see more of Greg's work um, on B12oils.com. Uh, the links are in the description in the video. And again, please remember that I don't make any money. Uh, off of this project. So if you would like to have more podcasts like this, you're welcome to suggest guests in the comments. Uh, and uh, you would be very useful if you could donate. Um, if you want to make a donation, just PayPal me at byhackingmyillness uh, at gmail.com. So I hope you guys like this and until the next video and good health.